Hello, and welcome to this professional development. Boston Public Schools Arts Integration Model, Designing Integrated Instruction with Core Subject Teachers. Goals for today's session are, this professional development opportunity provides arts teachers with an overview of arts integration models, provides examples of arts integrated lessons by arts discipline, theater, music, visual art, and dance, and provides access to scope and sequence documents for other core subject areas, such as ELA, social studies, and math which may be used when planning lessons and activities. The agenda for today's session, there will be welcome and introductions, which we will actually put off until just a little while when our arts teachers uh, make their sample presentations. Uh, they'll introduce themselves at that time. So we'll probably skip through that part. Then we'll talk about what is arts integration what are the three basic types of arts integration? Finding scope and sequence docs for other disciplines. And then we will take a look at some sample arts integration lessons. Okay, and as I just mentioned, we will put off introductions until that time when arts teachers make their presentations. Um, I will introduce myself. I'm Paul Sedgwick. I am the Curriculum and Content Specialist in Theater for Boston Public Schools. I'll be guiding you through this uh, professional development module. Okay, what is arts integration? Arts integration is an approach to teaching in which students construct and demonstrate understanding through an art form. Students engage in a creative process which connects an art form and another subject area and meets evolving objectives in both. And this is a key element that um, sometimes arts teachers become a little bit wary of um, uh, wanting to do arts integrated activities because uh, I think there is fear that the art discipline in question will be compromised as a result of, of using it to teach another subject or to enhance another subject. And um, that certainly is not the uh, proper way that arts integration is done. Um, and in fact, arts integration is built into our national arts standards. For example, uh, in the dance standards, making connections between dance and other disciplines under music, we have understanding relationships between music, the other arts, and disciplines outside the arts. For theater, we have comparing and integrating art forms by analyzing traditional theater, dance, music, and visual arts, and new art forms. And under visual arts, making connections between visual arts and other disciplines. So the idea of, of, of integrating uh, art forms with other subject areas uh, for exploration is really is part of our national standards. And here we go. This statement, I think, really sums it up nicely. Balancing arts integration with sequential curriculum. Interdisciplinary curriculum should be an expansion of, not a substitute for, a sequential comprehensive curriculum in each subject discipline. In other words, uh, none of the disciplines or the, the teachings involved in an arts uh, integrated unit should be compromised by virtue of their being involved in this, in this project. In fact, if it's done correctly, all of the subject areas, all of the art forms become uh, e even more appreciated um, and perhaps even more expanded as this uh, statement suggests. This is an awesome checklist. If you do find yourself working with other teachers and planning an arts integrated unit, um, you can ask yourself these questions. Are meaningful connections made between or among the disciplines? Meaningful connections. Is in-depth learning promoted? Are high quality examples from the arts and other disciplines used? Is appropriate 
terminology used? Are the artistic processes of creating, performing, and responding incorporated? Is assessment ongoing throughout the project? And is there a final evaluation of student learning? So when you go to begin to work with other teachers, uh, these are a few things that you should keep in mind. Make sure, of course, that you know your own discipline standards, scope and sequence. Uh, if you can access curriculum maps, uh, that's awesome. Spend some time online researching the other disciplines, standards, scope and sequence, and curriculum map. You know, uh, know thy neighbor. And start having conversations with your colleagues. Um, no matter what level of arts integration that you engage in, there needs to be some minimal level of communication between the art, the art teacher and the other discipline. Okay. So here are the three types of interdisciplinary arts collaborations. And these are general uh, ideas. Um, what you end up doing may or may not fall squarely into one of these buckets, but, but here they are. Parallel instruction model. We will discuss each of these uh, in a little more depth in, in a moment. Cross-disciplinary model. Infusion model. Okay, so the parallel instruction model is an agreement between two or more teachers to focus on a common topic, concept, or body of knowledge. Each teacher employs the content and processes representative of his or her distinct discipline. Students make connections between disciplines through their teacher's planful synchronization of instruction. This is probably the most common way that arts integration happens not necessarily the, the best or the deepest, um, but it's, it's, the, it's the simplest way to just say, to work with teachers and say, hey, let's do something together based on, on this. And then not a lot more planning than that might go into this, this style of arts integration. Um, here's an example of a parallel instructional model. Um, you're studying the culture of Japan now and long ago you want to incorporate social studies, visual art, dance, and music. And so as students study Japanese history and cultural traditions in their social studies classroom, they simultaneously study Japanese traditional contemporary art, songs, instrumental music, and dances with their visual art and or music specialist teachers. You can almost think of this as kind of an add-on approach, although it could go deeper could go deeper. Here's the cross-disciplinary model. Cross-disciplinary instruction features team planning and ideally team teaching. Several subject areas address a unified theme, concept, problem, or challenge. Arts teachers and other subject area teachers may meet together to engage with students or may meet with students independently. But teachers should meet frequently for common planning. Connections between disciplines will be more explicit and powerful if teachers choose to demonstrate their expertise and the interplay of cross-disciplinary ideas through team teaching. So here we're trying to get the various teachers to, to really be working together, even having students together with, with the teachers involved all together at the same time. And here's an example of a cross-disciplinary model Let's say you want to focus on uh, Porgy and Bess and American Opera. You have a visual arts teacher who may work on costume and set designs. You have a dance teacher who will experiment with choreography, uh, drama and English language arts teachers who are looking at acting and script writing. Music teacher is exploring opera, voice categories and style. And social studies teacher is looking into the civil rights movement, African-American history, social studies events. Here's another uh, possible example for a cross-disciplinary model. Uh, focusing on STEM, invention, engineering, acoustics, technology, and music, 
acoustic and digital instruments, composing, performing, and art, visual art, design, and construction. Another example, the science of sound, as students study principles of acoustics and sound production in science classes. They simultaneously study sound production on musical instruments, acoustic and digital, as well as vocal production with their music teacher. With their visual arts teacher, they apply acoustical principles to the design, construction, and ornamentation of original instruments. Unit extension could include improvisation, composition, and public performance on invented instruments. Sounds exciting. I would want to, I would want to be in that class. And the third type of interdisciplinary uh, arts integrated collaboration, we will call infusion instruction model. The depth of a teacher's knowledge and the well-rounded background of the students become critical. One teacher who, who has sufficient depth in multiple subjects may be able to teach in this infused manner, but most often a collaborative team will, be need, will need to be involved. Students' learning and outcomes in infused approaches are focused on strong relationships between complementary subjects. One project or activity may show students learning in both areas, since the relationship is so integral to both. Students accustomed to a classroom without artificial partitions of time and division, that's a dream for some of us, of subject matter into packages, may regularly consistently apply and transfer knowledge from one discipline to other disciplines. In addition, students may develop robust habits of mind to seek, establish, and test connections. This type of uh, process obviously would require probably a whole school movement um, or certainly a, a large group of very, very dedicated, motivated teachers to take uh, arts integration and working with teachers together to this to this level. Possible example, Peter and the Wolf, a new twist on an old tale. We'll have music, visual arts, theater, ELA, creative writing teachers working together. In music classes, students study Prokofiev's classic Peter and the Wolf based on a Russian folktale. Once thoroughly familiar, familiar with the traditional piece, students work in cooperative groups to put a new spin on it. Maybe they invent a new animal character to infuse into the story or decide when the character will be introduced. They rewrite the narration. They introduce this new character and establish its relationship with other characters. Include the new character in the capture of the wolf. Describe the new character on its way to the zoo in the final scene. Compose and notate a musical theme for the new character preferably one they can play on keyboard or recorder. Read at least three different picture book versions of the tale, carefully examining the different styles of illustrations in the books. Create three original artworks that depict the three script modifications they have made. Perform their work on stage using found objects for props, set, costume pieces, and or puppets, and stuffed animals to represent the characters. This might be delivered by a single music teacher or a collaborative team. Here's another example I'm gonna uh, try to move a little more quickly, origins and development of jazz in America. We'll have social studies and history teachers working with dance, music, and visual art teachers. Uh, in, in music classes, students study the African and European musical attributes which fuse together on US plantations as the slaves express themselves under captivity. The various forms of jazz which evolved from the African and plantation musical traditions are traced. Each genre and style is studied within its social and cultural context. Blues, ragtime, Dixieland, swing, bebop, and other things like bluegrass, one of my favorites. Issues of racial discrimination are discussed candidly, as well as the lives of selected giants in each genre. Music teachers consult other teacher specialists who are not necessarily teaching this unit. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. You guys can come back. You can pause this and read these things in more detail if you'd like to, but I wanna move on to the next topic, which is researching curriculum for other core subject areas. It is surprisingly easy to do, and here's how you do it. 
Of course, the best way to work with other teachers is to have conversations with people in person and plan your project that way. But it's always nice to be able to take matters into your own hands and check out what other subject areas are supposed to be studying. So let's just take a look at this document. This is a link that we will make available to you guys um, through a district-wide email. And this is a very nice little spreadsheet. <clears throat> Shows you by subject area and by grade level with links to examples for what scope and sequence is for students. All these students, all the way up through grade 12. So there is that amazing document. All right, now we will take a look at sample lesson plans from several Boston Public Schools arts teachers. Uh, this past summer, we had a study group looking into arts integration, and um, we had team members from each of the arts disciplines uh, who will now present one uh, sample lesson plan focusing on their arts discipline and talk about how they have uh, created an arts integrated unit branching out from their arts discipline into other subject areas. So here we go. Here is our first presenter. Hi everybody, this is Connie Cummings. I'm the visual arts teacher at the Roger Klopp School where I teach students from K-1 to grade six. I really enjoy integrating other parts of the curriculum into my arts teaching. I find I can teach uh, my curriculum without a whole lot of changes and I find reinforcing what the students are doing in other classes uh, really exciting. So this particular lesson called Color Stories uh, connects color theory with creative writing. I've done it uh, mostly with fourth grade because they seem to work on more creative writing and they work on poetry in fourth grade. It could easily be adapted for grades three to 12. Um, this is a lesson that I saw from another art teacher, Hope Knight, and a novelist and blogger named Ingrid Sundberg. I've listed the standards there and how they uh, hook into the mass core art standards and the objectives. The students in this lesson will mix 12 tints, shades, and tones of a given hue and assign a descriptive word for each color they create. Those words will then be used as incentive for a writing prompt that they would do with their ELA teacher. And I've noted that this lesson is a more advanced color mixing lesson and it should follow a lesson on mixing secondary and intermediate colors to create a color wheel with 12 colors. So your students should have that basic knowledge before they would begin with this. Um, I would begin this lesson with a discussion of looking at the crayons in a crayon box and just how many blues are in the box and how different they are from each other and what are the different names. Then I would introduce the work of Ingrid Sundberg. Ingrid is a collector of words is what she calls herself and she's used uh, the color colors as her latest collection. She writes, one of my ongoing word collections is for colors. I love to stop in the paint section of a hardware store and find new names for red or white or yellow. Having a variety of color names at my fingertips helps me create specificity in my writing. I can paint a more evocative image in my reader's mind if I describe a character's hair is the color of rust or carrot squash rather than red. So I've listed um, Ingrid's Color Thesaurus site and you can go and see all these gorgeous colors. But here's one example where she has uh, 20 different rectangles and names that she associates with them. So this is what your students are gonna be doing in class first. And they're gonna start with a grid 
a piece of paper with a grid on it, simply drawing 12 more or less even boxes. What I've done in some classes is um, make the grid myself and put it through the copy machine on a 90 pound paper so that it could be painted on. So your students are gonna select one primary or secondary color, blue, green, yellow, orange, red, and then have on hand black and white. And with some very careful mixing, they're gonna create different tints and shades. And then looking at the color wheel, they'll be adding a complementary color and they'll be adding some analogous colors. I tell the students when they're mixing, no two colors should be the same. I say no twins, each one should be a little bit different, but they will create a color family. Um, I also remind kids, um, especially the, anybody who's on the younger side, how important it is that we wash and clean our brushes carefully. Just a little bit of black in their paintbrush can really change up a color in a, in a drastic way. So at that point, the kids have something that might look a little bit like this. Here the students added, uh, you know, black and white and the complementary colors to create 12 different colors. Um, at that point, I asked the kids to think and come up a name for each color that they've created. I encouraged them to think about the senses, what would a certain color taste like, what would it feel like, what would it sound like, and they come up with the 12 different words or phrases that would be associated with the colors that they created. They have a lot of fun with this and there's absolutely no right or wrong answer. We all interpret color differently and the idea is just that to get them to associate between a color and a word. So from that point is when the writing begins. And ideally you would collaborate with the classroom teacher, the ELA teacher, on how we're gonna take these uh, 12 words and use them in a creative writing assignment. And when I've done this in the past, it's been either a story or a poem that we've done. But the one requirement is that they need to use at least half of the words they came up with in their writing. So here's an example of a color poem. This is kind of standard. Green feels like a slimy frog. It tastes like a Granny Smith apple. Smells like the grass that's just been mowed. Sounds like a grasshopper chirping or looks like the first day of spring. In this example, a, store, a student took um, the words that they came up with from their uh, color mixing and put them together into a nice story with these beautiful descriptive words. The final step, and you wouldn't have to do this, but I think it kind of complements the whole project, is to take one of the words from the poem or the story and draw it on top of the uh, color grid that they made. And this is best used by using a um, oil pastel in black and white, or it could even be a black and white paint to get high contrast. So that really, really dark red is probably gonna look a little bit better with white on it. And the lighter colors are gonna look better with black on it. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't have a picture here, but in the past I've displayed the um, student artwork along with the writing. Um, I've listed what you need for this project of paper, uh, paint, you know, different color paint, uh, black and white, uh, paintbrush, et cetera, et cetera. It really helps to have a color wheel or if the kids have made a color wheel in the um, preceding this assignment. Um, here's the vocabulary, art vocabulary, some of the EL words that have come, ELA words that have come up thesaurus, simile, metaphor. <clears throat> and for the assessment, basically, was the student able to mix 12 different tints, shades, and tones? Are they all different? Was the student able to brainstorm a name for the colors? Was the student able to use at least six of their names in a creative writing exercise? In terms of differentiation on this lesson plan, strong, strong examples are gonna help a, a lot as well as demonstrating the painting process. 
Um, if students have difficulty with fine motor, a pre-printed grid is going to be very helpful. And if 12 colors is just too challenging, you could easily do this with six colors or nine colors. In terms of doing this at home, you could easily do it with crayons and colored pencils, just reminding the students that they should vary the pressure when they're coloring to create different values. Also overlapping the colors uh, will create a variety of new colors. In terms of resources, uh, the author, Laura Vaccaro Seeger, has written a couple of books. One is blue, one is green that show all the different shades of blue and green. And those are actually available um, on YouTube videos as well. If you want any information on writing color poems using the five sentence senses, I've listed a resource there. Anyhow, I hope this will make you think about maybe incorporating some of your color mixing lessons with some creative writing, and I hope you have a lot of fun. Thanks a lot. Hi, my name is Katina McLean. I teach dance and Afro-Indigenous cultural history studies at English high school. I teach grades nine through 12. And today I'm gonna to be presenting to you um, an arts integrated lesson, which is actually part of a larger unit, which is gonna be part of a new course at English high school that focuses on the history of African and indigenous peoples pre and post colonialism. And this is a lesson that um, I'm very excited to present to you today because it has originally been adapted from an ESL level one, two curriculum in addition to a Spanish one level one, two. So it's already set up wonderful. If we have bilingual students, um, some of the materials are already in Spanish and in English as well. So um, this particular lesson is entitled Writing with Art or Escribe con el Arte. And so there are two major learning objectives. Um, the content area, students will learn about, um, specifically in lesson one, Mexican artist Diego Rivera and how art can be used for storytelling. And then for this particular lesson, you can always, what I love about this lesson, though it was originally designed for nine through 12, it can also be adapted for younger lessons, um, for younger students at younger grade levels from the K through eight level. Um, in this particular case, we focus on creating stories for part two which we're not gonna quite go into today, but we focus on the present tense. Um, so this is just how we can adapt it in ELA if you have a specific grammar topic that you wanna focus on. And we also talked about transitional phrases and words in this lesson as well. But for today, we're gonna to kinda of just keep it very, very simple for you, but just so you know that this is a very rich um, lesson that hits multiple discipline, uh, disciplines, um, not only in the arts, visual performing arts, but also in languages, world languages, um, in addition to ELA. So this is a question that we will start out with with the students, just getting them warmed up. Do you like art? Which art form is your favorite? Um, and the idea is really for students to be able to connect how art is a part of culture and history. And many times I, students kind of feel that they're not always interconnected. And this is, lesson is hopefully going to be able to kind of reinforce that. And once again, you have it presented in two languages and it can also be translated in a variety of other languages as well. So we focus in this example of who is the artist, um, giving students a little bit of information on who is Diego Rivera, because the first pieces that we'll be looking at in today's lesson, they are works on Diego Rivera. Um, so just a little brief introduction of who he is. And then we get into what I like to say, the fun part is really taking a look at the art so students are able to get more involved with the lesson. So we just ask students to take a look at what they see. Um, What's great about this lesson, it can also be modified. Um, the differentiation, if you have students that maybe aren't proficient with writing, um, anything can be done orally as well, which is really, really great. Um, there are two essential questions that go with this, asking just the students to be able to observe, what do they see? What does this say about the people's culture and the history? And you can go more in depth with that, um, the area of visual arts talking about how can the use of colors affect one's mood? or attitude or what story they're trying to tell or message they're trying to convey. So that's one piece of art that the students would interpret. 
And the second piece of the art that they would interpret for lesson one would be this. And this creates um, a larger discussion when we start to talk about um, murals. Um, and so murals are really, really popular during this time period. Um, and another way that the students will later be able to connect this work with an inquiry arts-based research project is finding ways that they can connect their own um, history and culture with various aspects of art. Um, so there's great examples of that here in the city of Boston, but this would be the second piece of work. And then there's another question that the students will later be responding to in either written or oral form as part of a larger discussion of what are you able to observe by looking at this? What does it say about the different peoples that make up the Mexican culture? And this is also kind of like the pre-work that we do to get them ready to start talking about the Mexican Revolution. And in lesson two, we get more into the historical components of the Mexican Revolution. We start to talk about different heroes of the Mexican Revolution, such as Emiliano Zapata, um, Obregón, um, Pancho Villa. And so they get to dive in a little bit more in what's happening historically, but also the government um, at this time and what is also happening in the rest of the world, not just in Mexico, once again, to make those connections. So as I said, this is part one of a very large unit. Um, and so I hope that you enjoyed looking at a little bit of art and being able to figure out what these pieces of art are trying to tell you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Fabiola Decius, and I'm a theater teacher at the Quincy Upper School. I teach grades 8 through 12. Today I'm going to be talking to you about arts integration, and my lesson is going to focus on code switching in the novel and movie, The Hate You Give. Um, again, I teach theater, and the curriculum integration will be focusing on foreign language. So it could be Spanish, French, Mandarin, or any other language. And this is for high school level students. The key text that we're gonna be focusing on and media is The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas. Um, you can read the first three chapters of this book online for um, the Epic Reads website. But the excerpt that I'm going to be focusing on is actually on page 71 in the text, and I can read it here for you. I just have to be normal star at normal Williamson and have a normal day. That means flipping the switch in my brain so I'm Williamson star. Williamson star doesn't use slang. If a rapper would say it, she doesn't say it, even if her white friends do. Slang makes them cool, slang makes her hood. Williamson Star holds her tongue when people piss her off so nobody will think she's the angry black girl. Williamson Star is approachable. No stank eyes, side eyes, none of that. Williamson Star is non-confrontational. Basically, Williamson Star doesn't give anyone a reason to call her ghetto. I can't stand myself for doing it, but I do it anyway. Now what I'm going to do is show you a clip. Mama and daddy were born in Garden Heights. Their first kiss was in the Haven Acres projects. Daddy says our life is here. Cause our people are here. We got Mr. Rubin's barbecue. Mr. Lewis's barbershop. Walmart, 32 minutes away, and Daddy's store. Carter's Grocery is where you get your milk, Newport shorts, hot Cheetos, hot gossip, and anything else that you might need in a hurry. Mama thinks Daddy is scared of change. She left the garden when she was a little girl, and she wants us to get out too. Either way, you gotta stay ready because Garden Heights is always going to be ready for you. Seven, now you stand at your mama's house or with us tonight? At mama's, as long as King ain't there. And then there's King. He runs the King Lords. My dad used to be his right-hand man. 
high school is where you go to get jumped, high, pregnant, or killed. We don't go there. Nonsense what happened to my friend Natasha. So mama sent us to another school where everyone's college bell. Heights is one world, Williamson is another. And I gotta keep it separate. So when I'm here, I'm star version two. That means flipping a switch in my brain. Williamson star doesn't use slang. If a rapper would say it, she doesn't, even if her white friends do. Hey, boo. Hey, how are you? I'm good, girl. Slang makes them cool. Slang makes me hood. Yo, those kids are lit. Thanks, Space Jams. Williamson Star is approachable. No stank guys are yelling because Williamson Star is non-confrontational. Basically, Williamson Star doesn't give anyone a reason to call her ghetto. I hate myself for doing it. All right, so that was a clip of The Hate You Give. Um, it's a 20th Century Fox movie and it came out in 2018. So if you are interested, you can have students watch the entire movie. But in all honesty, that clip should be sufficient enough for the purposes of this assignment. So the Massachusetts core art standards in regards to foundations theater are convey meaning through the presentation of artistic work, describe how decisions about a performance are connected to what the student wants to express, evoke, or communicate. Then there's also interpret intent and meaning in artistic work, identify theatrical decisions from a work that connected to a specific genre or style. So the student objectives for this lesson is, are students will analyze elements of code switching within the novel and movie of The Hate You Give based on the main character, Star Carter. Students will perform a monologue excerpt of The Hate You Give and code switch using a foreign language. Again, you can use Spanish, French, Mandarin, um, or maybe another language that students are already familiar with and speak at home. And then students will write an explanation of how and why they chose which keywords and phrases within STARS monologue to code switch with. The materials and resources can include a pen, pencil, or some other writing instrument, a notebook, laptop, or something else to take notes, a computer and projector to showcase the videos and any text. The key vocabulary. We're focusing on code switching, Sometimes it's referred to as language alternation, and it means the practice of alternating between two or more languages or varieties of language within the context of a single conversation. So on the right hand side, you'll see a image where it says, hi Miguel, hey Susan, how are you? I'm good, and you? Soy bueno, want to go to class? So in this image, you'll see that Miguel is code switching within that one sentence by saying soy bueno, which means I'm good, want to go to class. The lesson procedures for this assignment. So the first thing you'd wanna do is either have the students read The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas in its entirety, maybe the first three chapters, or again, you can have them focus on that short excerpt that I read a little bit earlier, which is on page 71. As the students are reading this, they should be paying special attention to STARS dialect and any elements of code switching. And they should be discussing the differences between who she is when she's at home with her family and who she is when she's at um, Williamson School. The second step would be to have students watch The Hate You Give. Again, they can watch the movie in its entirety. They can watch the first few minutes, which is what I just showed you. 
Um, this is available on either YouTube or other streaming devices. And you can have the students focus on specific elements of star code switching. One example I like to point out is when she's entering the school, she has her hoodie on. And then when she enters the school, she actually removes her hoodie and her brother does the same thing. And like that shows a element of code switching in terms of their costume and attire, because when they're in the hood or their neighborhood, they can wear the hoodie. But when they're in school, they want to give off a different vibe and persona. So they want to look a little more professional and more prepish. So they remove it. The third thing is to have a discussion with the students about the hate you give. I have some conversation starters, but you can feel free to think of some other questions. Some of the questions that I have are, why does Star feel that she has two different versions of herself? In the end, does she still feel divided between these two identities? The second one is think about how you speak and act in different situations. Do you change the way you speak and act when you are at home, at school, with any of your friends, in what ways, why might you do that? And then the last discussion question is, if you do speak and act differently in different situations, would you say that this means you can't be your true self at all times? Or does it feel like you're able to express different sides of yourself in different situations? The assessment for this assignment is to have students use Star as the character from The Hate You Give and perform that monologue that I read earlier from page 71. So if they're taking a foreign language in class, including Spanish, French, Mandarin, or something else of the sort, or a language that they already know and speak at home, have the students use that monologue from page 71 and intersperse it with code switching of a foreign language. So if they're speaking Spanish or French or Mandarin or learning that language in school, have them add that into the monologue. And then they should be able to memorize it and perform it in front of their peers. And following their performance, they should then write a brief response explaining how and why they chose which keywords and phrases to code switch with. They should also be sure to mention anything that they may do differently with their gestures and mannerisms within their performance. In terms of differentiation, educators can create monologues as samples to perform in front of their students to give them an idea of what it is they're looking for. You can also create a specific template using keywords and phrases for students to translate into another language. So that way it doesn't put the burden and onus on the student to figure out which words and phrases to translate, you'll tell them which words and they just have to figure out how to translate it into Spanish, French, or Mandarin. Another differentiation idea could be based on the student's needs, don't have them perform the entire monologue, but a shorter excerpt of it um, so that they can be able to do it to the best of their ability. Lesson extensions. So you can use the hate you give in a psychology class as well. So the students can use the novel and a term that is frequently used in psychology, which means third culture kids or a TCK. And that basically means individuals who are or were as children raised in a culture other than their parents or the culture of their country of nationality and also live in a different environment during a significant part of their early development years. So Star, although she didn't necessarily grow up in an entirely different culture than her parents, she is submerged in a different environment on a daily basis when she attends her school at Williamson. So an assessment or assignment that you can have students do in their psychology class would be to write an original monologue from Star's perspective indicating what it feels like to be a third culture kid. Students can use elements of code switching within the monologue to then accurately compare and contrast what Star is like on a normal, versus, normal basis versus what she's like when she's at Williamson School. For virtual modifications, this lesson can be used you will just have to have the hate you give read online or maybe using an audiobook. 
You can stream the movies or movie clips online as well. There are clips available on YouTube, or you can also use other streaming websites. As far as the performances go, in a traditional classroom setting, the students would perform live, but you can also have the students perform their monologues live during synchronous class time using Zoom or another platform. Or you can just have the students record themselves performing their monologue asynchronously and then they could submit it to you via Google Classroom or email. On the right hand side, I have some additional resources and links that you can look at for more information about code switching. There are TED Talks, there are specific examples of code switching in different movies and films. And so I hope that this is helpful to you and that you're able to use the hate you give and be able to um, use it as an arts integration lesson. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Kara Campanelli and I'm the general music teacher at Mission Hill K-8 through Pilot School in Jamaica Plain and I teach grades K-0 through 8th grade. Today I wanted to share with you Dr. Seuss Rap, a syllable exploration, which is a lesson plan I created um, and have utilized to combine music and ELA skills for grades 3 to 5. Key text or media for this are multiple YouTube videos, as well as the book by Dr. Seuss called Walk It In My Pocket. And these videos outline either how to break out words into syllables so that we can really activate that knowledge for students and bring it back into the music class from their classrooms, as well as a Walk It In My Pocket parody song, which is a parody of the version Walk It Like I Talk It, um, the Migos song, of which we would use the karaoke, and certainly not the lyrics. We're touching on several Massachusetts core art standards with this. We're refining and completing artistic work and responding to a musical challenge and hypothesizing possible solutions. We're also generating and conceptualizing artistic, artistic ideas and work. We're using interdisciplinary musical ideas, using a variety of non-traditional sound sources like found sounds, in this case, digital technology and unusual voices. Student objectives are that they will be able to create a unique character inspired by Dr. Seuss, like their own version of a locket, and they'll be able to identify the number of syllables in its name, and students will be able to create and perform or record a rap using their unique character. Materials and resources you'll need are a large line paper, another option is a whiteboard either in the classroom or the whiteboard in Zoom, and colored pencils, crayons, or markers, pencils and paper, laptop and speakers, and that's for the teacher and optional Chromebooks or audio stations for students, especially helpful if they are at home. Um, and key vocabulary, we've got syllable and beat. Now to understand where I'm coming from with this lesson plan, I really wanted to share with you the original video that I saw that inspired it. Um, this is Jay Lava's parody of the Migo song, Walk It Like I Talk It, but this is Walk It In My Pocket. So I hope you enjoy it and get as inspired by it as I did. Ready? Yeah, you got your angle. Yep, I need to get my, I need to get that. But you know where this came from. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Seuss. Hey. Here we go. There's a pocket. You see it? Pocket. There's a pocket. You see it? Pocket. Ah. Walk it in my pocket. Huh? Walk it in my pocket. Okay. Walk it in my pocket. Sister. There's a walk it in my pocket. Oh, walk it in my pocket. Ah. Walk it in my pocket. Ah. Seuss. In my pocket. Seuss. There's a walk it in my pocket. Mama. Did you ever have a feeling? There's a basket in your basket. Or a neural in your bureau. Or a was it in your closet. Sometimes I feel quite certain. There's a jerkin in the curtain. Sometimes I have a feeling. There's a zap behind the clock. And that zap up on the shelf. I have talked to him myself. I said that zap up on the shelf. I have talked to him myself. That's the kind of house I live in. There's a ink up in the sink. And that zap up in the lamp. And they're nice, I really think. A mama. And some of them are friendly like that yacht up in the pot. But that yacht up in the bottle. Some are friendly, some are not. Mama. Like that zabo on the table when that gear under the chair. But that bofo on the sofa. Well, yeah, I yeah, wish he yeah, wasn't yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. When those numbers in the cupboards, yeah, they're fun to have about. <laughs> but that new brush on my two see him, I could do without. And that one I'm really scared of is the bug under the rug. Said the one I'm really scared of is the bug under the rug. Damn. And that chimney in the chimney, I don't like him at all. And it makes me kind of nervous. Uh, and the zossos down the hall. Mama. 
and the yips up on the steps. They are great to have around. They are many, many other, other friends that have found. That's the teller and the neller. What? The yeller and the teller. And yeah. the beller and the weller and the zeller and the seller. Huh. And that yelling on the ceiling and that sour in my shower. Shower. And pillow on my zillow. I can talk to him for hours. I don't care if you believe it. That's the kind of house I live in. The and I hope I never leave it. You can't come. You're forbidden. Come back. I don't care if you believe it. That's the kind of house I live in. Yeah. And I hope I never leave it. You yeah. can't come. Yeah. You're forbidden. Yeah. Walk it in my pocket. There's a walk it in my pocket. There's a walk it in my pocket. There's a walk it in my pocket. Mama. Walk it in my pocket. Walk it in my pocket. Walk it in my pocket. There's a walk it in my pocket. Seuss. Mama, read me a book. <laughs> read me a book. <laughs> All right, so I love that video. Um, J Love also has other versions or other um, other videos in that same vein. Um, so the rough outline of this lesson, after now that you've seen the Walk It Like I Talk It video, is that we would want to show the other video showing um, how to break words out into syllables. We would practice that with student names, passing around a drum, really tying those syllables to a beat or to a rhythm um, is where we want to start. And then once we've shown the parody video, we would discuss the difference between speaking, singing, or rapping and use different demonstrations of that, utilizing the book. Um, and then we would make a syllable cloud. And what I mean by this is normally, or very often you'll, you know, create a word bank or a word cloud so that students can really see something in front of them to pull and draw ideas off of, and you can brainstorm that as a group. But in this case, we'd be looking around the room or breaking out words that we find in a book to their separate parts and then kind of mixing them up and jumbling them around so that students can really see where the word started from. So maybe you write out um, violin on the board or on the whiteboard, and then you would make sure that you broke that out so that you could say by o lin in different spaces and mixing that up with other word parts and other syllables. Um, and then you maybe practice as a group assembling those into different ways. So what would a four syllable word look like using the different syllables in our, our cloud? Um, and that's when you would, as a group, create a group or a class creature, a Dr. Seuss inspired creature. Um, and you would do that by pulling together different syllables from your syllable cloud. As a group, you decide, okay, these are the three syllables we're gonna work with for our creature. Let's put them together, which goes first, which goes second. And then you decide, what does that creature look like? Where can we find it? What does it like to do? What does it like to eat? Where did we meet this creature? Because that is the we do before they go off and work on their own in groups. Oopsies, pardon me. To create their own creature in the same way. So in their groups, forgive any typos you see, in their own groups, they would um, create their own creature, compose their rap, they'd be answering those five questions. And while they're writing their rap, just build off of those questions. It doesn't have to be tied together with sentences if they prefer not to, but obviously that's helpful. Um, is underlining the words in different colors depending on how many syllables those words have. So one syllable words would maybe be red, two would be blue, et cetera, et cetera. You wanna have them have a visual component of this very crazy Dr. Seuss creature, and then we'd have them practice against a backing track. After that, we would share out and everyone would need to participate in some way. And that's a great callback to the video because even though there was one lead in the video, there were still other people um, acting as backup and contributing. So maybe a student is doing that, maybe they're playing a drum, maybe they're dancing. There's a lot of different ways to share out. Our assessment of this would be the, um, the written assessment in that we're looking to see an answer to each of those questions. We're looking to make sure that the students themselves know how many syllables are in their creature, or that as a class they're able to determine the syllables in everyone else's creature. Um, and we're looking at that color coding but we also want to hear whether or not they are able to rap as a group. So as a music teacher, you want to see that they can make that determination. And I do want to see that everyone is involved in some way in that final performance. Differentiation, students could record 
their share out or their performance. They could either do it as an audio file or they could do it as a video file. And that would be ideally shared with the group. Um, or the students could also be given an existing SUSE book to wrap. Now that's also a variation of the lesson, but that's something if they're really, really struggling to create or, or code their words, then you can give them something that exists already and work with them on breaking that out. Because really we're just looking to see if they can wrap and we're looking to see if they can determine the number of syllables and words. And our lesson extensions, as I mentioned, is that you could use other Dr. Seuss books and give students a choice of a couple different backing tracks and let them work with that and create their own parody wrap. Um, and similar to that, this could open the door on an entire parody unit. So you could have them do a different song that they are then working with um, and just diverging from Dr. Seuss, but really introducing the concept of not only parodying music, but also it's, it's kind of a parody of Dr. Seuss. Virtual modifications, which I've mentioned off and on, are that, for example, if you're on Zoom, you can't really do group work in keeping a beat around the room while students go through their names or break out um, words into syllables at the beginning of this whole unit. So you would encourage students to clap or use found objects to beat the syllables of their name at home. Um, videos and sound can obviously be shared via Google Classroom or any other platform so that they can practice on their own independently. Um, and also you can use a, uh, a group approach to the creature. You could have each student take on a specific role, um, a specific like stanza or, or chunk of the rap that you end up brainstorming as a team. You can color code that rap together or the lyrics of that rap together. So that is my Dr. Seuss Arts Integrated lesson for music and ELA for grades three through five. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you feel inspired by Walk It In My Pocket as I do. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Sadie Soto and I teach dance at Mildred Ave K through eight. The lesson that I'm going to be sharing with you today is called The Life Cycle of a Butterfly. The Massachusetts core standards are conveying meaning through the presentation of artistic work, moving in different ways that match cues, directions, and artistic interpretations, generate and conceptualize artistic ideas and work, generate dance ideas that utilize levels, high, low, pathways, shapes, and directions. Students' objectives. Students will be able to express, convey, and interpret the four different stages of the life cycle of a butterfly through dance movements and incorporate creative thinking and demonstrate understanding of the sequence in the life cycle of a butterfly. Lesson procedures. Teacher will review the life cycle of a butterfly by showing this clip. Chrysalis, butterfly egg, caterpillar chrysalis, flutter and fly in the sky. That's the life cycle of a butterfly. Changes, changes round like this. It's called metamorphosis. The butterfly lays her tiny eggs on a leaf. They're so, so tiny and hard to see. The eggs hatch into a small caterpillar. It munches lots of leaves and gets bigger and bigger. The caterpillar hangs in the shape of a J. A chrysalis is formed, the caterpillar is changed. When the caterpillar's changes are all done, a beautiful butterfly it has become. It's amazing. The butterfly's metamorphosis happens in four stages. Butterfly egg, caterpillar chrysalis. Butterfly egg, caterpillar chrysalis. Flutter and fly in the sky. That's the life cycle of a butterfly. Changes, changes round like this. It's called metamorphosis. Okay. So that would be just to catch their attention and make sure that they remember what the cycle is. The teacher will explain how each cycle will be presented differently and how 
and what they can do in order to make it um, interesting when they create their dance pieces. Each um, section should not be longer than one minute long. So the egg stage. Students will explore low level shapes while incorporating non-locomotor movements like melting, bending, curling, twisting. Also incorporating curved shapes, balancing and contracting to explore the egg stage of the cycle. The larva stage. Students will explore low level shapes while incorporating non-locomotor movements like melting, arm and leg extensions at a low level. Students will also work on making their shapes symmetric and asymmetric while maintaining a low level to explore the larva stage of the cycle. The chrysalis stage. How would you portray it hanging from a tree? Students will use mid-level shaped movements. Students will also explore incorporating different pathways like straight, curvy, and zigzag. Students will also change directions, moving forward, backwards, diagonal, and sideways. Adult stage, taking flight. Students will have to use their imagination and figure out how they will interpret this particular stage. The students will be free to move at different levels, high, middle, and low using different pathways, straight, curvy, and zigzag, using different directions, forward, backwards, diagonal, and sideways, extending to represent how the butterfly finally has wings and is ready to fly. Materials, resources, text, media, and technology. Teacher will have a poster of the cycle of the butterfly where students can see the four different stages clearly marked. Each stage will have some suggestions for students to explore movements for their dance phrases on each stage. Paper and pencil will be needed to record the movement phrases for each particular stage. Key vocabulary for dance, locomotor, non-locomotor, symmetrical and asymmetrical. Science, the larva stage, the pupa stage, metamorphosis, which is the process of transformation, changing shapes, for form of nature into a completely different one. The assessment part. Did the student have a clear beginning, middle, and end on, their, on each stage? Did the student show a clear understanding of the cycle? Was each stage at least one minute in length? And was the student able to recall all sections without looking at their notes while performing for their peers? Differentiation. For students with special needs and for ELA students, the teacher will have a pre-made poster of the cycle of the butterfly in each room. Each stage will have a description of the dance elements that students can incorporate in their dance phrases. Virtual modifications. These are two short video clips. I'm only going to show one. Hi, my name is Ethan. This is my brother, Justin. Today, we're going to talk about how caterpillars turn into butterflies. We got some butterfly larvae and watched them turn to painted lady butterflies. First thing that happens is a butterfly lays an egg when it hatches and turns into a larva. Larva is also called a caterpillar. We put our caterpillars in a bowl with sticks and leaves and caterpillar food. Did you know that the caterpillars eat all the time for the first five to ten days? They grow bigger and bigger and even shed their skin. We watched our caterpillars that they grow and each day they got bigger. After seven to ten days, the caterpillars start to hang down from a leaf or a branch. And it forms a cocoon by chewing its caterpillar skin. This is also called a chrysalis. We 
This is so cool. Watch this. As you can see, it's a very interesting video that the students will surely love. But for time purposes, we're just going to skip a little bit. Um, so the students will watch with the teacher and the lesson will be broken into four lessons to cover each stage. So if I was doing this virtually, I would show this video clip first and then I would break each section of the cycle for each day. So I have enough time for each group um, to perform it. Students will watch a short video clip about each cycle. Students will be given five minutes to all work independently and share with the class at the very end. This will be done with each cycle. Monday, the egg, Tuesday, the larva, Wednesday, the chrysalis, and Thursday, the adult and fly. So that video that I showed, I would um, break it down into the four days. I wouldn't show each day the whole video. Students can volunteer to put all four stages together to complete their entire dance based on the life cycle of a butterfly. Some, some students are more shy than others. So what I like to do is to give everybody um, a fair um, chance. If a student is more comfortable just sharing one stage, that would be just okay. If somebody's more outgoing and they wanna put all four stages and they're very creative and they have the time and the enthusiasm to get music for it, I give them the freedom to do that as well. Again, nobody's judged on their dancing skills, everybody's judged on their effort and creativity. Sources for this lesson were from Smart Class Kids. They have some great information and I would finish the lesson by saying the life cycle of the butterfly is an amazing journey of life. Butterflies change shape through four different stages during their lifetime. Thank you very much and I hope you enjoy my dance lesson explaining the life cycle of a butterfly. Thanks. Wow well that was some pretty amazing stuff and I hope you guys are all inspired to look into this and to not feel daunted or upset if uh, your administrator in your building comes to you and says, hey, we'd like you to work with so-and-so on their math X, Y, or Z. Or, hey, the social studies teacher is doing this really cool thing. We think maybe you might like to get involved. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's the best thing for kids to see how uh, these different disciplines can, can work together and to see you and your colleagues working together. Unfortunately, we cannot do any uh, questions or comments in the moment because this is pre-recorded, but please feel free to contact any of us here on the arts team in Boston Public Schools. Uh, Anthony Beatrice is our executive director for the arts for the Boston Public Schools. Emmanuel Toledo is our program director for the visual and performing arts. Uh, that's me, Paul. I'm your curriculum and content specialist in theater. And Amy Wedge is your curriculum and content specialist in visual art. So please feel free to contact any of us. Take note of our uh, prefix on our email there, bostonpublicschools.org uh, is the tag, of course, for everybody. So I look forward to speaking to you and answering any questions you have. And have a great, great school year, everybody. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.